Hi, and welcome to the masterclass on cinematography with Denson Baker. Um, this is a short introduction. Denson is an award-winning cinematographer whose credits include Ophelia, starring Daisy Ridley, and Victoria, star starring Jenna Coleman, as well as being a part of the cinematography team for the acclaimed Get Out, directed by Jordan Peele. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go around introducing each of us. So I'm okay. Bath, I'm the producer. Um, uh, Maddie, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Maddie. I'm the writer and director. Hi, I'm Corinne. I'm the cinematographer. Hi, I'm Sasha and I'm assistant producer. Cool. So I'll go into the introductory questions now. Um, so when did you know you wanted to be a cinematographer or even work in film? Yeah, I've, I've always loved film, even as a kid. And I was uh, probably about uh, 12 years old when I first started playing with a video camera and making short movies with uh, with my toys and and just wanting to you know make little animations or, or you know, films with my friends so I'd always had a passion for filmmaking loved the idea of just creating worlds that uh, that didn't really exist but could as an audience member go in and experience them and then um, the more I uh, and I grew up in I was from New Zealand but grew up in Australia which and in a part of Australia which wasn't um, there was, it wasn't really a filmmaking community there. Uh, Hollywood seemed like a whole nother planet from where I was coming from. So it didn't really seem like a, a pursuit that I could take seriously. But the, the more I, uh, I, I, I just started to play and do things like that, the more I, I realized that was my passion. And I first started out thinking that being a director was uh, the thing to do. And so I went to a, uh, an art school in, uh, in Perth, Western Australia that uh, had a media design course, which you would do a whole variety of all the different aspects of filmmaking, but um, I went in there thinking I'll direct, but because I'd loved the camera and played with it so much, and, and I do have a bit of a technical mind as well, I found that I was more and more attracted to what I could do with the camera. Mm -hmm. And the other students around me were starting to ask me to shoot their projects. And, uh, and then just, I just started to experiment more with lighting and with cameras, and I was shooting 16 mil film projects. So every project that I was doing with the other students, I'd Sort of set myself a little challenge or try something new or do something different with every project so i found myself developing or trying new things each time and so then uh, towards the end of that uh three years of art school i could see that cinematography was was my passion and what i loved and so i applied for the australian film television radio school which is uh it, it's a quite an exclusive school with only four cinematographers a year four directors four editors and um and that was really what I wanted to I mean I was so passionate about wanting to get into that course and uh, which I didn't on my first application but the uh, cinematography uh, lecturer the head of cinematography she said um, that she felt I had a an eye and that I had uh, what it takes but suggested I go out and get some more professional experience on set which was great advice so I spent a year where I started off as a video split operator setting up um, monitors for the director and the DP and which was great. I mean, it's sort of the, the one of the lower positions for in the camera department, but I learned so much during that time on the film. And it was a film which the director was also the lead actor in it. So I was doing a lot of playback for him and I'd hear the conversations that the that the director and the cinematographer had. And it was it was like a whole new film school, that experience. And, it's, and I was learning the kind of stuff that you don't learn at school just from, from being surrounded by that. And it was kind of like a mentorship, I guess, in a way. And then I started working as a camera assistant, focus puller, did some camera operating, started shooting various other things, and then eventually got into the film school. And at that point, I came in as a director of photography, and that was it for me. I knew that's that's this is this is my journey now. This is this is all I want to do, and so focused really hard during that period, and came out at the other end um, where I shot my first feature film two years out of film school, and um, guess haven't really looked back. That's so impressive. <laughs> Um, do you have any tips then for students that would like to follow in your footsteps? Should they go into film school? Was it helpful to you or should they just sort of like experience the film, like filming a film? Yeah, I definitely like for me, it was a balance of both. And I feel if I had have just gone straight into film school, I may have missed out on a lot of, uh, of an education that is, is quite different where you're learning about just onset behavior to the hierarchy and to the respect that you should be giving to to the director and just how things operate on set so I learned a lot of practical things from from being a, a camera assistant for other cinematographers and you know, just absorb so many ideas and you learn a lot of things of you know I don't want to do 
I don't want to work like that or I don't want to have that attitude. And so I learned a lot. And it's also from those experiences you start to to bond with um, with other filmmakers. But by going to film school, it meant that I was I was able to experiment a bit more. I didn't come straight into being a, a, a cinematographer and have the pressure of a of a big budget and uh, and not you know and not being able to make mistakes because they they you know cost a lot of money if you if you ruin a, a shot or make a bad decision or take too long on set and that can end a career if you're just starting out and you have a have a disaster so I think having some time as a student is um, where, you, where you get to play and also I have to say the the, the people that I went through film school with um, many of them are the same filmmakers I'm still working with today I met my wife at film school and we're still working as a director and, and DP there's other um, collaborators production designers who I still work with so it's it's also a really great launch pad for for a career as well by going to to film school mm. um you mentioned sort of like maybe wanting to do directing at the start and then discovering director photography a lot of people don't quite know what it entails to be a cinematographer or a dp would you be able to just like walk us through what the ins and outs are day to day yeah like? yeah well the i mean the textbook description of a director photography is that you're directing the visual style of a project when it comes to lighting and camera lens choice camera placement camera operating uh, and you're ahead of a department. So there's there's grips, there's camera assistants, there's a lighting team that are working with you and, and you can say underneath in a, in a sort of a hierarchy way. Um, so it's a very, I mean, it's a highly creative role but it's also quite technical as well. Um, and it's also a leadership role there too. Um, yeah, but um, I think in day to day, it uh, like for me, uh, like it, it doesn't just start on the day of the shoot. It's a lot of it starts right there in prep from first reading the script to breaking down the script to having meetings with the director, with the production designer, swapping ideas. And um, I, I like to do, I like to bring a lot of ideas to a director after I've spoken through what their vision is for the film. Um, I find uh, that if I'm meeting a director for the first time, I'm not going to go in there and start bombarding them with images and say, this is how I see your film, for, I mean, for two reasons. One is they're still deciding if they want to work with you. And if you show them the wrong stuff, they might think, okay, I don't want to work with that person because they don't, they don't see the same film I do. Um, but also you don't, you also want to let the director really express all of their thoughts for how they see it and then interpret it and then add a bit of yours and you can expand upon it or, you know, they might love what you're bringing to the table that they hadn't thought of either. And I find that all directors are so different as well. I've worked with some directors that are incredibly visual and they'll have lots of references or they can draw their own storyboards. But I've worked with other directors who aren't too interested in that side of filmmaking. They just really want to focus on getting great performances and they want to trust that the cinematographer is going to just put the camera where it looks good and where it works and get some, some great images. And I don't think there's a, a right or a wrong way there. I think it can totally work. Um, with just I think just it's something that you once you know how that director likes to work then you can adapt to it and and then work that way but the day-to-day -day you do you know it does start with you know already having a shot list prepared maybe a, a, a um, some storyboards and I would have communicated to my team well in advance whether it was in pre-production during the, the tech recce that you usually have about a week out um, before you start shooting where you'll go and visit every location and you can say to the lighting team you know we're going to be looking this way and we want some light coming through these windows to the grips team or we're going to start on a dolly or we need a crane to the camera assistants who they're going to want to know um, you know where how far away is the truck going to be how long is it going to take to get the equipment there and what you know they like to know what you're starting on too so if they need to build any special equipment they've got that already so that as soon as the day the day starts they're prepared and they're ready to hit the ground running which is so important if you've only got a 10 hour day um, you don't want to spend the first half hour of that day explaining to everyone what's going on when you could have saved that time and and already be already be underway. But it's also thinking on your feet too. I think that um, what often happens is you'll start with these grand plans and this very long shot list, and then you're halfway through the day and you realise, oh, we've got a lot to do after lunch, and I don't know if we're going to make it. <laughs> and then you got to start thinking, well, how can we? adapt our plans how can we shoot this in three shots instead of six or how can we do those six shots but keep it keep the camera rolling maybe we can reframe one shot to turn it into two shots and and uh, and things like that so you're often often thinking on your feet and often having conversations with uh, the director and the team of how to be efficient and how to um how to do do things and 
I think that's that's one of the, the main things is just being ready to be adaptable and ready to you know adapt the plans if a better idea comes up or if uh, something's not going to work for whatever reason and sometimes that can be quite hard but the more prepared you are the more easy you can be ready to make those kind of decisions that's so interesting um also this is like more specific a question but when you're making a film like get out which involves like highly surreal aspects how do you compose shots that feel sort of real and surreal and like kind of going back to the previous questions how would you go about doing that yeah well I, just to clarify uh, straight off that, that I, I wasn't the the main unit cinematographer on get out uh, it, was a, it was a good friend of mine toby oliver who's a fantastic cinematographer and he he shot the film and with um uh, a lot of how blumhouse films uh work that they they'll often have an opportunity after they've finished that first edit to then revisit some they can do some reshoots if they feel like it's going to improve the film a lot which they felt with get out that they could do a they wanted to reshoot the opening scene they wanted to do a different ending after doing some tests and there was a few other shots which jordan felt he wanted to do something a little different or from just reactions that he felt from the from the test screenings that um they didn't work as well as he had hoped so he he had the opportunity to go back and shoot some scenes and toby was unable to do those uh, reshoots and so um, Toby asked me if I could do them and and it was such a great opportunity because it was such a brilliant experience. And it was quite different for me as well because I don't usually have to come in on the back of someone else's already established style. Um, but for me, it, was, it, felt, it felt quite easy because I, I felt like it wasn't too, deviating too much from a style that I could do um, myself. And so I had, a, I had a lot of fun with that. But that is a very different, very different film to some of the other period films that, um, that I've shot. And um, I mean, in regards to your question, like um, because it was reshoots, um, and and Jordan is he is a very visual director, and, and and he's very much a performance and storytelling director. He had a very clear sense of what he wanted, how what he needed, and how he was going to do it. And he is excellent at communicating what he wants and and how to do that. We were lucky. We I mean, we only had to do a couple of days of pickups, but we had um, it was over a week of prep where we went to the location and got to walk through uh, like for the opening scene, we walked through what needed to be done and were able to choreograph. I, I used my iPad, um, just choreograph a shot, which we just tried various different ways of having the camera move on the steady cam, and which as part of that, we had to think about how we're gonna light it as well and how some lights were gonna be in shot as the steady cam moved, or they were gonna be, they'd be too bright in one direction and not bright enough in the other direction. So we had to come up with a few clever ideas. We had a few, few days to work out how we we're gonna do that from, having lights on dimmers to having uh, people carrying lights that then when the camera turned around, they could pan them off and run and hide behind a building and not be seen in shot. To, we had a street light, which was on a dimmer and we had one of the electricians hiding behind a tree. So it was bright enough as a key light as we're coming with it behind the camera. But then as the camera turned around, they could dim it down. So it wasn't overexposing when we saw it in the background as we came back. So um, it was, it was yeah, a chance to sort of come up with some clever techniques to be able to do, to do something like that. That's so cool. Just as a follow on from that, is it is that the sort of best part of it is coming up with sort of like clever solutions to problems that you you like at the start of the day you have no idea how to fix. That is, yeah, and that can be quite satisfying when you do um, come up with creative solutions like that. But often it's it's problem solving where there's a way you would really like to do it, but for some reason that's not going to work. You can't afford it. Don't have enough extras. There's a building in the background that doesn't look right. There's so a lot of those decisions aren't always how can we make this cooler. It's like how do we get around the fact that we've it's not going to work if we do it any other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then a final question from the introduction: Who's been one of your? You mentioned Jordan Peele, but who's been one of your favorite directors to work with, and which film slash project? Um, I mean, I've, I've had great experiences with most of the directors I've worked with, but I'd have to say my favourite director is Claire McCarthy, who I've done a number of uh, films with, but she's also my wife. And I'm doing, <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing the next uh, film together. We start in a few weeks. Um, I think I'd get in trouble if I said, uh, if I didn't say it was her. But, um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, she's, I, I do love working with, um, with Claire. And she's, uh, she's, what I love about her is she has a very much a visual uh, eye, a visual style. She doesn't like to lock into uh, the same style. She like, like, I feel like all artists, they, you'll go through different periods and different things that you like or don't like, or you want to try new things. And, and she's, she's like, and she sets challenges as well. Like she wants this next film to be, you know, 
better than anything we've done before, but have some really interesting ideas for how we can do that or what might be a, a nice thing to try. Um, and really thinks a lot about story as well, which isn't something all cinematographers um, do or get involved in as much as I guess I have with her, where you really look at what you can say with camera and with color and with lighting and, and camera movement and, uh, you know, whether it's using a drone or a crane or a handheld camera or you know, just really think about how does that affect the audience's perception of this moment, of this scene, of this character. And, um, and I have a lot of fun having those conversations. And kind of going from um, talking about, you know, who you've worked with and stuff, I think you have prepared for us some of your previous projects or previous stuff that you've worked on, um, which you're going to break down and kind of give us a bit of insight into your creative process. Yeah. Um, would it yeah. be you to share the screen um, mm -hmm. and then you can kind of get that up if that's possible? Absolutely. So um, you should see this desktop here. So I've made a folder. I picked a few in case you want, there's a few other things that came up that you wanted to talk about. But with every project I do, I always build a folder of, um, well, it just starts with things starting from shot lists to references to things as they come up. This one I've, I've put, I've made it a little more organized to just to show you guys some things. But I've put them in order of how things evolved with the project Ophelia, which I thought might be a nice one to talk about because um, it has, I mean, you talked about cinematography that has a painterly style, which is definitely something we set out to do with this film. We wanted it, to, we wanted frames that not only had a painterly quality, but we were literally homaging some famous paintings in it as well. Um, and we did some really nice, interesting things with that film. But so the first thing that we did, oh, and I'll just move that back across to the other page, was we made a lookbook, which I think is such a valuable, actually, why don't I try just doing a preview? Oh, that's a bit embarrassing. Let's try that again. There we go. That works. Um, yeah, so we did a lookbook, which uh, I think is a great exercise for a cinematographer to do regardless, but with this one, it's because the director was my wife and we were pitching on the project to actually um, to get the job for it. So we put together a lookbook for that reason. And then we started to hone that lookbook as that was used to go out to cast or to show to investors or to just to, whenever a new person came onto the set, onto the, um, onto the project, we could show it to them. And you just get so much more information than you do from just reading the script. So we, we put that together where we pulled some frames from, this is from a perfume commercial that we loved. And this was a, we had a concept artist to a very rough, I mean, this, if you've seen the film, this is not what the film ended up looking like, but just to sort of give a bit of an idea of the scale and the use of color. Um, we had a little description of the, the character and a couple of little shots to sort of show where we saw that going. We worked with costume designer who did um, some initial sketches, which were put into that, um, there. So already just from looking at those images, you start to get a bit of a sense of the, of the tone of the, of the film and the color palette of the film. Um, shots of castles and um, each character has a little, a little piece there. And so for me, this is as a cinematographer, you start to then look at shots and frames. You, I was pulling these from other films that we liked and we liked the lighting of and the color within. So you're starting to talk about framing and lens choice and color grade and things like that. Um, so a look, I think a lookbook is such a great thing. And you don't know, this is one we made to present and show to a lot of people, but some sometimes I'll make a lookbook, which is just a, a stack of images that aren't necessarily as well laid out, which is just to get a sense and a feel and, and talk about color. Um, and just to ask, I see that you've kind of added lots of things about kind of costume and the general look of mm. the film as well. When you actually go into shooting it or in the prep for it, how much do you, how much control do you have over that? Or is it kind of a collaborative process between you and the costume designers? Absolutely. Well, somewhat collaborative, but more it is like we've, we're usually working with costume designers who really know the staff. So I'm not getting, I'm not interfering in any way. It's more just so that we're all talking the same language. And yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, the conversations I'll often have with the costume designer are if there's a particular lighting style for a scene, I'll, have that conversation with them to say if the scene's going to be quite dark or it's going to be mostly backlit or if it's going to be really bright and front lit those are th that kind of information is something that the costume designer is needs to be aware of because they don't want to come out on set and then see that all this exquisite detail they've put into a costume is now disappearing into the shadows 
um, they might say, well, do you have to shoot it that way? I want, oh, this is like a, a, a special piece here. We want to really see that costume. So that's, that's all stuff that really needs to be talked about. And so much of the, the color palette of a project is, is in the costume design, the production design, really what I'm bringing to the color palette will come with the choice of colors within lighting and the color grade somewhat, but you never want to push it into a, into an area that it's not already going that way. I mean, it's really got to come from what's in front of the camera rather than what you're trying to put on top of it for it to, for it to look natural. At least that's, that's how I feel. Yeah. The other thing we did, and I won't, I won't show you the whole thing, but we made a, um, a mood reel or a rip reel. We sometimes call it, um, like this is one we made, which was, um, I'll show you a little bit of it, but basically it's, um, it's made to be, um, I'll just turn the sound down. We made this, that's just under two minutes long and put it to a piece of music. This is like a, um, can you hear that, that, hear that music too? I can't you might hear be switched up. Oh, okay. Well, I'll talk over that then. Yeah, this, it might not be set up to, for, to play music, but um, yeah, this was, this is like an extension of the mood reel, oh, sorry, of the lookbook where you're just giving a little bit of impression of some of the shots, some of the tone, um, would choose a piece of music, which uh, highlights that um, um, the, you know, the sort of the style we're going for and the tone that we're going for. Um, so yeah, this is, I mean, this will be coming from pulling trailers from pulling shots from other films and, I mean, it has to come from other films because you haven't shot it yet. So you, you're never wanting to, we weren't setting out to make exactly what these other films have done or wanting to rip off their ideas, or even though it's sometimes called a rip reel, but it is uh, intended to just sort of be a communication starter. So you can start saying, you know, what the, I mean, even if it is to show a costume designer and they say, well, I don't really like that, or to show an actor and they're like, well, I don't want to I don't want to do it like that, or I don't want to look like that. It's, it's, I mean, I think that can only be a good thing if you're starting to have those conversations about what works, what doesn't, and so everyone's on the on the same page. So a mood reel is something would often do. And that's also often done when pitching on a job too, to you know, show to a, uh, a producer or a uh, investor or a studio, um, you know, what you've got in mind. Um, so yeah, we did a location references um, piece, which this was uh, something which you'd send out to um, uh, location scouts or to just even to the production so they can just start think seeing okay this is what the this director and cinematographer and the and the team have in mind they start to just get a feel of I mean they're not going to go out and find exactly what's in these books but at least it's start to, starting to have a conversation I guess so that's another handy handy thing to make um, and then what happens is the places that we're going to they'll start sending stuff back and then you can start to decide whether you even want to go to that country and we, this was um, uh, Slovakia, we were thinking of shooting at one point, which I mean, and it wasn't because they didn't have great locations, they got amazing locations there, but they sent a book of images back to us to, as sort of an answer to our our references to say, this is what we've got in, in Slovakia and, and what do you think? Something that Claire does, and I don't think she'll mind me showing you guys is a uh, production approach, um, little booklet doesn't do it on every shoot, but it's such a handy thing to then send out that people can read and that immediately they start, I mean, I've put in camera um, information, what camera we're shooting on and what lenses um, they were shooting anamorphic, two cameras, that kind of stuff. But uh, it's a place, it's, it's like, it's a time where you can just start to make clear what some of your intentions are to, to people. And it's such a handy thing to do. Um, you never want to be sending and saying, this is what we're doing, because there might be some people say, well, actually, that's not how we thought we would, we would do things. But again, it's good to get the conversation started. Um, one of the things that was in there, and it's a philosophy that, um, that we've had as a director cinematographer team is that we like to have a, like an 80, 20 rule, we call it. There's, I mean, other films, might that they, they do the same thing where they say that if it's a visual effects um, if there's visual effects sequences in there that you don't necessarily want it to be a full computer generated world that 80 percent of what's in that frame is for real or it's designed or it's placed in there and and what the visual effects is doing is doing maybe 20 percent of adding more detail or architecture or, or background or various things like that how do you decide when vfx is going to come into it is it quite sort of a hard decision to make or is it quite like easy, like off the bat, like that's definitely going to need VFX? 
Yeah, I think, well, that's what's interesting is often a, the when, I mean, you can, you, you'll know pretty much when you first start reading the script that oh, we're not going to be able to do that. We're going to need to use some visual effects or something to be able to, um, to make that happen. And you'd go out to some visual effects companies who you think you might work with, or you've already chosen one to work with, and they would do a visual effects breakdown of their own. Um, I, I'll often do my own visual effects breakdown too, with just what I think, and then you can start to compare what each other are thinking. But um, they'll do, they'll go through the script and they'll say, okay, well, this this scene, it sounds like they're going to need to do some set extension. They're going to need to, it's got some stunt where they're going to need to do wire removal. Or that, uh, visual effects people, they've worked on enough films that they kind of know what needs to happen in various different scenes. So they'll they'll do their own breakdown, which then usually what will happen is they'll do a budget for that and it'll be way more than what you can afford just because you'll be trying to do everything you can. And then there's more conversations with how can we do things differently or do we really need that shot? Do we really need to do it that way? And then you'll just sort of whittle it back until you've got something that's affordable and something that you can actually um, you know, achieve, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, I, I do lots of different little booklets. This was one I did for lighting references. Um, this is this is one that I send to um, the. Well, I'd sort of show it to the director, perhaps, but then it would go to the um, the gaffer as well, just just to start having conversations about this is sort of the lighting style that we have in mind. Um, I think this is this is so handy because to describe a shot, if I was to say it's you know I want to be able to see warm candlelight, soft on the faces, and have green background or sort of you know greeny cyan backgrounds, like that can be interpreted so many different ways by different people. But by having a reference shot and saying you know I really like the look here, but I want to do my own version of it or my own style, it's just it's a really great um, a great talking point. And I think the reason why I use so many visuals uh, is sort of evolved over time. And I do a lot of photographic storyboards as well, which I was going to show you. I think that started from, I've done a, a number of projects where I'd be shooting in countries where English isn't the first language. Um, I've shot in India and Italy and in the Czech Republic. I mean, everywhere I've gone, there's all, they, the, the crews all speak English and better than I speak the, the, what, any other language. So um, they've got an advantage, but it also, um, you just don't, there's, there's room for misinterpretation as well. So I, I like to just be so clear with my communication that by having visuals like that, it's really, it's really clear. This is the visual effects breakdown that I did, which I, I put in little shots within there. We, we got a drone out and did, did a test shoot with a drone and put, um, and then I just did a little quick little Photoshop um, job there. And like I took photos of our locations and dropped those in there. And we sort of describe what we need to do in each shot. Um, I took photos. I mean, I, I'll right from the very first location scouts will start looking at um, uh, potential locations, but I'll take shots which I see as being the uh, what might be a frame that we would shoot within it. So we start to build our storyboards based on um, on that. And so this was a this was a scene where we end up putting towers into the background and did some set extension in a in a set that we found, and then concept art goes in there as well. We had some really great concept artists on this and I've actually got some of the concept art here. Um, so the production designer did these, but based on my photography. So I took a lot of photos uh, of those places, like I was saying, but then send them to production designer. He'd pick ones that he liked and then send them to the concept artist and give them a brief. And then they could, um, you know, sketch into those photos. Oh, this is one that obviously didn't have a photo because that was built the um, castle interior. But on this film, we needed to do battlement, uh, um, you know, the, the top of a castle and the, um, um, what do you call the ramparts? And um, which we looked at so many in the Czech Republic before we realized there's just no way we could ever shoot on them because they're just, they're always too small. You always got to go up little, very narrow staircases and they'd be so hard to get gear up there, let alone light them is the big challenge. So for this, um, the production designer built a, a battlement, which we scouted a location where we found a, a hill, which was large enough to build our own one on, but had a great view that we could see almost, I think we had like almost 270 degrees of just trees and hills and, and, um, and nature around us. So we could, we could shoot um, a lot of scenes on there. We only had one half a day and half a night to, to work on it. But um, yeah, that, that ended up being something that they, we had to build and couldn't find. But yeah, I, I love um, great concept art, and yeah, I'll, like I'll just keep feeding images to 
to the art department, they can start making more and more images with it. Do you do like all these preparatory lookbooks and pieces of concept art when you've been booked onto a project or before? Yeah, usually uh, for me, it's usually once once I'm on it or with like Ophelia, it was Claire, um, director slash my wife was pitching to, to direct it. We, we teamed up together to make start making those as a, as a pitch document, which she had all of her director's notes and did her own um, aspects to it. And she was a big part of designing that lookbook as well. She was pulling pictures and finding images. And so it was, it was a group effort. I'm not doing this stuff on my own. Um, so that was done in advance of actually getting a job, which happens quite a lot. And I also, I, I haven't had to do it as a cinematography, but I've heard a lot of, and actually I, I missed out on some jobs because I didn't do lookbook presentations. Cause if it's a, a, a team you've never worked with before and they're meeting a bunch of different DPs, they, um, they'll often, you know, they'll have to make a choice. Who's it going to be? And if someone comes in with a really great lookbook and a really great pitch, and this is how I'd see the film and it's right on par with what the director's thinking, then that person has an edge over you to get the job, I guess. Um, so it is, it is helpful to do that, but often we'll do it. Um, usually once we've started uh, going out to, to actors uh, like that, I've done a lot of lookbooks on it where we have started the job we've started location scouting and now we want to go out and get our stars and we want to have a package that's more than just just a script which you know actors get can they can get up you know 10 20 scripts a day arriving in their inbox and you know you want to stand out amongst them so to have a really great lookbook can can be enough for them to say okay i can see a vision here i can see that we're in safe hands and that the the team have a have a really great idea for it mm. Mm. do you want to see more stuff um, I was just thinking it'd be quite interesting to see how you storyboarded something because I think when you're doing a student short mm. film you often haven't done that if you've done theatre projects before so it'd be quite yes. interesting how you went about doing that. Absolutely now where have I put my storyboards I want to show you I think I haven't put them in here can you hold on one sec um, I might have to show you storyboards from another project I did have some good storyboards for that but here we go, here's a, okay, you know what? I won't show you those because these. this is one version of storyboards where we had a storyboard artist who was absolutely brilliant and did um, sketched uh, often what was from location photography that I had done. This is from the Luminaries TV series. Um, and that's one way of doing them, which if you're not good at drawing, which I'm, I'm not, uh, isn't necessarily the, what, the only way to do storyboards. I mean, these look like graphic novel storyboards um, and he was brilliant. And the director and I sat together and um, with the storyboard artists and really gave gave a good brief on how we wanted to do those. But um, I didn't put, oh, here we go, cinematography files, storyboards. Thank goodness, that could have been <laughs> embarrassing. Yeah, here's, um, let me start with this one. So this is the Ophelia storyboards where there were some shots which we couldn't, we knew we wouldn't be able to um, do the way that I usually do storyboards. So we had we got a storyboard artist in who was also like a graphic novel um, artist who to draw very specific shots. Which this is the opening scene from Ophelia, which we needed to we wanted to have a technocrane shot come across the water surface and then rise up above her. And there's no way you can do a pre-visualization of that. Even we we did it. We did it did end up doing one on a drone where we wanted to see just how long a crane we needed and where we were going to position it because we needed to build a rig that was going to descend. Daisy into the water and, and submerge. So we had to get really technical about how we we're going to build that. But this was with the first storyboards to start having the conversations there. But there was other ones, and this is what usually what our storyboards will look like is uh, photographic storyboards, where like this is one where I took a photo on the location scout, the, the, the concept artist put in the sketch there, and then that became our reference for what the wide shot was like. And then the director, Claire and I, and her assistant and one of the production um, team came out and we just blocked the scene where we just had um, had people stand in. That's Claire, the director there. Just We just get to have a little bit of a chat through how we see the actors uh, positioned and they're blocking and just take photographs and then use those as storyboards, which for me, I, I actually prefer those to sketched 
drawn hand drawn storyboards because they are like that's the background you're going to see that's the position it's going to be i can see how wide it is and i can even show the production designer we're not going to see any wider than that so we're never going to see that corner of the set don't we don't have to worry about that or i can show the the lighting guys well we can put all of our equipment here or this is where we can light from because it's it's literally a shot that we're that we're going to shoot and how we're going to shoot it um but to to do that thoroughly for the feature film you, you want to have a lot of time to be able to collect all these images and what inevitably happens is there's always one or two shots that you can't take a photo of so you get the storyboard artist to do a little quick sketch that you can throw into them mm -hmm. but i think like looking at these sketches i mean look at these photos most of the shots in the film are pretty much kind of what we what we saw in these photo storyboards and i mean when you're doing photographic storyboards you can start to already talk about lenses and what what lens you'd be putting there and what and the camera placement and then you can also see what um what it needs whether it's a high angle and you need a a ladder pod or if it's a um, going to be a steady cam shot you can start really working out some of those technical things um just by standing there in, in the actual place and taking photos and it's a great uh, thing for the director as well to just have start having those thoughts about blocking with the with the cast but the thing that I would definitely want to stress is that, for, like for, for us, one for me, I we're never going to lock in an actor to say, this is how we did the photos with these people who aren't actors and we want you to do exactly what we're telling you to do because that no actor would appreciate that and they might have better ideas and do something differently anyway. It's really just a guide to start things going. And in fact, usually we won't even let the actors see these um, storyboards because, you know, it could throw them off or that start to question it or wonder why that, why is that guy posing as me that I look nothing like that you know you just don't want them to you don't want to put them off in any way yeah so that, that that's I mean for for me the more prepared we can be the better the the, the shoot's going to go so that's 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 our storyboards there oh, can, I I, how, mm, can I ask how long it takes you to develop all these plans like in pre-production like how long how much do you commit to it yeah, well, I usually start um, pre-production like on a on a feature film. It's usually about six weeks is the is the pre-production time for a cinematographer. Production designer usually gets a bit longer. They might be on for two or three weeks before I start. Um, so in that six weeks, uh, sometimes locations have already been scouted before I'd start my um, pre-production. But, um, but if not, um, it, it starts with location scouts and it starts with looking at, um, at pictures. And I, I, for me, I don't like to rush into doing shot lists or, or actually locking in storyboards until real, because inevitably there's a rewrite of the script happens and then the scene numbers change and then all things disappear or things, something new comes up or you go to a location and you realize that there's a different way of doing things to, a different way of shooting something which you hadn't thought of because the location starts to give you inspiration so it's really probably in that last three weeks that i start to get really honing into specifics um, like the project i'm on at the moment where this is the fourth week out before we start shooting and i've just now started to put folders of the all my location photos that are starting to turn into what will be storyboards um, for a couple of reasons one is that um like i don't want to waste my time with putting in locations when we haven't really commit you know committed to those being our locations so i want to use my time wisely but also you want to just still keep your 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 mind open to possibilities and and ideas and see what what comes to you so i think it's probably about halfway through my process that i start to really get specific i suppose i could say mm. and just before we move on to our quick fire round um mm. Is there anything talking about your previous projects? I'm sure a lot of people from uh, watching on YouTube will be interested in Get Out, especially. Is there any kind of fun, kind of behind the scenes secrets that you can tell us about shooting that or did the process vary? Um, yeah, well, like I was saying, how I, I came in to shoot what had already been, the bulk of it had been shot. And um, so I, I got to watch the, the, the edit that was existing at that point and I could already see this is going to be a brilliant movie and I loved all the ideas that Jordan had for I mean so when I first I got sent the script and I which I read and then I met with Jordan and I didn't have the job at that point he wanted to suss out whether I was the right person for the job so it was a little bit of a job interview I guess but he right then just he really knew what he wanted and he had a really great way of, of describing what he wanted 
the thing that I observed more and more as I was working with him, that his, his approach to communicating what he's after wasn't always specifically technically how things were. It was more of it was how he saw the, the audience would feel or react at certain moments with it, which I found really fascinating. Like we would describe the opening scene and he would be talking it through as the character is walking through here and then he sees the car and then he feels this and the audience is going, whoa, what's going on? And they just sort of clock it. He'd be talking about just what the audience is seeing at that moment, which is such a in interesting and great way to, to direct a team because like I'm thinking, okay, so what's a what's a cool and interesting way of of getting that feeling and 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 you just start to see it in your mind when you start looking at it that way. Whereas if you were just to talk about the the technical beats of where the camera is and where things happen, it can start to become a little bit more mechanical and you, you're trying to t turn it into a choreography rather than a sort of free flowing. Um, you know, it's something which needs to feel you know organic and feel like it's playing out rather than feeling too contrived. Um, so I think that's that's a really that was a really interesting approach to to working that I really liked. Yeah, well, that's great to know. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so now, if you don't mind, we're going to move on to the quick fire round. This is kind of being a DP mm. for dummies. Kind of, there are no silly questions. If people are coming from like a base knowledge of zero, they mm. there might be silly answers though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they won't be. Um, so we'll just quickly go through about five minutes on this. Um, so the first question is, how do you go about creating continuity throughout your works? Um, within a project, I guess, the continuity within a single, that's a really interesting, okay. yeah, I mean, that's not a quick fire answer because that is such a, a, an interesting challenge and it's taken me a while to sort of get a handle on it, but it's so important to really do that thinking in prep because you're never shooting in order. You'll be shooting scenes from halfway through the film in your first week and you might be shooting the start of the film in your second last week so you've really got to track that visual style but also that emotional journey which the actors do the director does they do all that and it's good for the cinematographer to do that too is to really track where those high points are where those moments are where you want to have your biggest close-up or where you want to have your crane shot or where they want to have the intimate coverage or whether it's the the big epic wide moment so you really want to track those things through but i think for me to, to create that visual continuity, it starts with um, sort of putting a, a, a language of what tools you're gonna use or how you're gonna approach it. So with the project, you know, it's usually just the one type of camera, unless you wanna be having different visual styles that change throughout it and pick, a, pick the set of lenses or test a bunch of lenses and then pick the ones which really work. And then would start to say, okay, uh, this size lens looks great for our intimate mid shots. This size is what we wanna use for our wide shots. And then you start to have a, a continuity there where you're not just using different random choices with every scene when they could start to look a little bit um, bouncing all over the place. But then you also have a bit of a color palette that evolves throughout there. And usually it happens in the art department, lots of images start going up on walls and they're, okay, this, this location is gonna look like this and this location is gonna look like that. And then you start to see a color palette come together and you can start to spot if things don't really look like they fit within the same same look and style of the film and you can start to then hone it into, into creating a, a, a cohesion of visual style that way too. That's great. Yeah. I think obviously lots of people um, watching this will be students maybe thinking about making their own short film with a quite small budget a lot of the time. Um, what would be kind of your top tips or the things to prioritize um, in terms of making a short film or a low budget film? Would it be kind of specific cameras, lenses, sound quality, um, is there anything important? Yeah, well, sound quality is something which I have learned is so important. And you want to, as a cinematographer, it's not your job, but you certainly don't want to compromise the sound recorder's job because no matter how pretty your pictures are, if the sound is terrible or you can't hear what the actor's saying, it's, it's not going to be a good movie. Um, but I think that it's not necessarily having the highest quality camera that makes a difference, but it's, it really is what you put in front of it. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, somewhat, I'm talking about the lenses, but also like, I think I've always felt like a really beautifully lit shot is always going to look beautiful, no matter how it's shot or what camera it's on. But if it's a not, if it's bad lighting on an actor or just bad lighting in general, and it's a great quality camera and the best quality lens, it's just not going to have that production value. I think lighting is so, such an important element. And so I think it's also lighting doesn't always have to be expensive either. Like nice lighting doesn't have to be expensive. Like if you're lighting a big set, you're going to need some big lights. But if you're to light a really nice close up on someone's face, you can make it look like it 
you know, really high production value shot, but you don't need lots of expensive or tricky lights. It's really finding that really great angle on an actor. And I mean, I like soft light myself or whether it's bounce light, but just, I think you can, for, for me, like my approach is often to light the wide shot in a way that you can then, when you come in for your closer de detailed shots, you can then craft the light a little bit to make it really look beautiful and look great. Still have continuity with the wide shot, but where you can just have a little bit of control to do something really beautiful. And I think that's the moments when the audience really um, engages is when, I mean, it's, storytelling is mainly about the, the people, it's about the faces. So that's really where you wanna, you don't wanna compromise that. And kind yeah. of, I guess the opposite of that would be, are there any things which you constantly see going wrong in short films or low budget films? Are there three things that like, maybe you'd completely advise against doing? Um, to kind of get it wrong. Yeah, um, I don't know, because I think there's no real rules or there's, I mean, I think things sometimes don't work, but often they, they don't work for various reasons, not because the filmmakers shouldn't have tried them, but maybe they just weren't successful in how they managed to pull it off. Um, but I do think like my, it's like tips to short filmmakers. I think like it's really important, I feel, to think about your transitions. Um, like not a lot of cinematographers always think about how sequences are going to be edited but to have a really smooth flowing and like professional looking production if you can think about what's the last shot in a scene and what's the first shot in the next scene and how do you move between them I mean that's that's kind of the director and the editor's domain but if the cinematographer can be thinking about that too you can be providing great shots that can really make those transitions really work for you um, and I do also think that um that something which is so important and I often talk about it is that you, you really want to think about what what are the most important details in every scene that you want the audience not to miss and do it in a way that is not heavy handed you don't always need to have the big close up on the object that's the important thing in the scene but it, it's got to be communicated you can't have an audience guessing what what was that that they were holding when that's the key thing that everyone should be taking away from a scene or you'd never want to have the um the audience not sure which character is who or or so you really want to think about how you're lighting those characters or it's, so they're really you know it's really clear who's who's who and what's going on um because as soon as you lose your audience there then you've kind of you've kind of lost them yeah actually someone said something interesting the other day okay they're, 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 these, these are two interesting things one that i felt is that like um continuity of lighting is is less important than continuity of a visual style within a scene there's something which i've often felt like often you'll see a scene where um you see one actor they're facing each other and they're backlit by the sun and then you cut to the other actor and that actor's backlit by the sun and you only pick up on it when you look really closely but if you were to actually shoot an actual um, continuity, one actor would have the sun blasting in their face and they'd have bad shadows under their eyes. And although it is technically, that's the continuity that you should stick to if you want it to be true to how light works, you actually don't have continuity of a visual style. And, and that's actually more uh, sort of troubling to an audience. They, they, you know, it's actually more jarring to see that. So I think it's more important that those, those styles sort of fit in the in the same look rather than what's um what's technically right and um i did have one other point that i wanted to mention i forgot what it was now maybe it'll come come to me later uh that's really interesting thank you so much and um kind of final question on this round before we get onto the um swim kind of specific stuff what is what would you say is the best time to capture natural daylight um is it really early really late what's the kind of mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I guess it varies depending on what the scene is that you're doing. I mean, traditionally, you know, early, you know, morn early morning and, and late afternoon light is the that's the lovely light. But it really depends on which way you're facing and what you're what you're doing. I mean, for me, it is all about that. I love backlit. Um, so like when we're making our schedule for our day with our scenes, I'll always want to start with the day, start the day with the camera facing towards where the sun is up and end the day with the sun facing towards the sun so we're, we're backlit for most of the day um and there's a couple of reasons for that one is that it looks looks better backlit where you can have a nice soft light on someone's face um but also that's where continuity becomes an interesting issue it's it's because you can like something you can do if you're if you're shooting a whole scene backlit if the sun's you know at three o'clock in the afternoon or if the sun's at six o'clock about to set you're still always backlit Whereas if you're fronted by the sun, whoop, 
currently by the sun and it's hitting someone's face uh, and you've got shadows there and then you cut to a shot you've done when the sun's lower, you've got different shadows on the face and then your continuity changes a lot. So, so backlit is actually, it helps you technically as well where you can, you know, it's always, it's like always backlit or it's, you know, or then you're looking at shadows changing throughout a, an edit, which you don't really want to see that happen. Um, I can't remember what the original question was. Did that answer that? Yeah, no, that's <laughs> Um, so going on to swim now, um, mm. I'll really briefly describe it. Um, it's about two sisters who are kind of struggling to get along, one visiting the other at university, and there's an indication that they've been having a tough time, although we don't necessarily know what it is. And they just kind of wind each other up. Um, and we want to capture quite like an intimate relationship between them. Um, and it also happens just over 24 hours. So I think the time passing in the in the story is really important. And so mm. it connects to everything you're talking about with light um, and also kind of communicating emotion and intimacy through camera work. Um, and also it's, it's um, very specific to kind of each of their subjectivities. And I think we'll be able to track through each scene, like whose subjectivity is more, most important in which scene and which part of the scene. Mm. Um, and also aesthetically, we're wanting kind of what you're talking about in terms of like soft light um, aesthetically and um, natural light. Um, and we also want it to have this filmy quality. Um, without having, I think we'll probably be shooting on a digital camera. Mm -hmm. So I guess the first question is a very technical one, which is how do you kind of convey that film quality on a digital camera? Mm. Yeah, well, I think f sort of film style lighting is where it starts is lighting it in a way that looks like you know, film lighting. But like, I've got a few little tricks that I have I've got a, a kit of filters that I often use and there's um I mean there's a few there's a few different ones that work but I like there's this um black satin is a filter I'll often shoot in front of a, a the lenses on digital cameras and it just I mean there's and there's there's lots of other ones that do similar tricks but I like black satin and black glimmer glass are my two favorites um like Ophelia we use black satin on every shot and on um Get out, which that's it was what Toby had already been using for the film, but he used um, black glimmer glass. Uh, and actually, it was just glimmer glass, um, which is more of a. I mean, you could look them up. There's they can get a bit technical, but basically, what that does is it just softens that digital edge a little bit, and it, so when it's coming through the filter, it just diffuses the highlight, so you get a bit of a softer glow, and it's a lot more flattering on the skin in the same way that a that a film might be that shooting on film might be. So sometimes just those those filters and, you know, they, they're not that expensive to hire. They are quite expensive to, to buy. But sometimes just a, a nice little diffusion filter like that can make such a big difference to a, to the look of a, of a production. And they're good ones. There's something that's really great to test though, because you might find you want to have a much lighter grade one when you're doing a wide shot and then a heavier one when you're doing a close up. Um, but I think it really does. It starts with with the the film quality lighting is where um, that that main thing is, and then also the lensing too. I mean, the thing about um, shooting on film is often, or on a, it's the same as shooting with a full frame sensor, I guess, or you know, it's your depth of field is a is a is a thing. So often, some people might say they want that cinematic look, and sometimes that cinematic look means a shallow depth of field with a soft focus background when it's appropriate. Mm. Um, so that's something else you can play with too. Yeah, and to answer your question about the um, intimacy and sort of changing uh, like who you're empathizing or with in various scenes, something which which I often do, and it's it's sort of, it is a, a bit of a film making technique that um, gets used a little bit, but isn't often talked about is is just your lens choice on various characters that if you want to have a feeling that you're um, relating more to one particular character and you're a bit more intimate with that character by shooting on a slightly wider lens, not too wide because you don't want to distort their face, but it's a wider lens uh, with the camera physically closer to that uh, character. You feel as an audience that you are like the cameras, you feel like you're much closer to the, the person um, than if you're on a longer lens um, zoomed in. And that's often a technique you'll, like I've used where 
your protagonist, you want the audience to be seeing the the um, the scene from their perspective. So we would shoot the shots, what we often call wide and tight, where it's a wider lens, but a tight shot. And then you could shoot the exact same framing on the other characters, but using a longer lens. So it feels more observational and you're sort of step back and you're looking at them. It's a very subtle thing, but it's, it's something which, you know, it really does as, as an audience member, you do feel like, okay, I'm, I'm with this character, but I'm observing those characters and it can make a big difference. And the other thing you might want to do is that if you, if you're shooting clean, um, as in not over shoulders or not through objects on your protagonist or one who you want to be empathizing with, but then when you're shooting others, you're shooting dirty over the shoulder. And I, for me, like, I feel like when I first started out, I felt like you, you needed to be technically, uh, matching your shots and that, if you're shooting one actor on on a 75 millimeter here, you got to shoot the other one that's matching. You got to have them all in the same bit of the frame, so it all cuts together seamlessly. Which certainly does, you know, there's some merit in that. But I don't think you have to stick to that rule. I think if you do mix it up, that can actually start to have an influence on the audience. You've got to really track it though, because if you start getting too random, it can start to be jarring or, or not really work. But it's it's certainly a, a lens choice can be a technique which can really help with that. Thank you so much. That's so helpful. Um, and I guess one thing that's really, really important to this shoot and you will have done on a much bigger scale with Ophelia is shooting in water um, mm. and how to capture that in a kind of like ethereal kind of intimate, uh, beautiful painterly like way rather than just, you know, they're just splashing in the water yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah well there's lots of different ways of doing underwater and often i mean often if the camera is fully submerged and not coming up and above the, the water often it, be, it can be shot on a completely different format sometimes you want to have a smaller camera because you can get a you can get cheaper um underwater housings like i've used one where we just had a 5d and a, there's there's a, a bag that you can get i can't remember what it's called but i don't know if you've seen these ones that you can just seal it up you've got to really test it because you don't want to ruin your camera obviously but once it's sealed you can you can do some great shots with that camera and you know what you find with underwater is that the further back you get from the subject the more murky they they are whether you're further back on a long lens or you know or, or a wide shot it just the, there's more water between you and the subject so it gets a lot more hazy which can be quite beautiful as well but if you're a wider lens up a bit closer, then then you'll see a bit more clarity on your subject and the, and then the background gets more hazy and disappears. Mm -hmm. I think also important for shooting underwater is choosing your time of day when you shoot. At the beginning and the end of the day, which you know it looks nice when you're, what we're saying is the most beautiful light when you're above the water, but when you're under, it gets very, very hard to see. There's minimal um, um, visibility there. To have direct sunlight and to have it just, I mean, top, top light, but it's slightly behind the camera. Oh, slightly away from the camera. So it's coming in towards the camera. That's when you start to get those little rays under the water, which is such a great look. And sometimes you'll just, you can set up a, 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 more, a stronger light that is just giving some rays, like a HMI light that you'd spot right up. But the, the, the key to that is if it's, if it's facing towards camera, you'll see the rays. If the, if the sun's behind the camera and then the rays are there, but you're not seeing them because the light's going away from the camera. So by choosing that angle, you get those nice little sparkly rays and hopefully that hits the subject you've got under the water there too. But the other thing that I've done, which is, um, uh, I mean, it's it's probably the more low budget approach to doing underwater, but it's not, um, doesn't really change the production value. It's, it's sometimes just like getting a fish tank is all you need to sit the camera in there, put a little, a little shot bag or sandbag on there so your camera's level but you can get some beautiful shots with the, with the camera in a fish tank and you just dip the camera a little bit so you can start above the water and then you can sink it under and you can have a really great look that's really easy to do and you can put a monitor on top of the camera and it's, um, you know, you can see what you're doing. You want to be very careful. You obviously don't want it to fill up with water or tip over, but it's such a simple way to get a great shot. You can use the same camera you've shot the film on because you don't need a, a big fish tank. You can just get one that's exactly the right length better to shoot with your smaller lenses and make the camera as small as you can and get the smallest fish tank that you need. But I find that's, that's great. I'm mean, going to just put a bit of gaffer tape around the top of the glass so you don't cut yourself and you've got something to hold on to. But that's something that just one person can do. And that's such a lovely shot too, when you're just, just below the surface and you can see the, the line of the water. And, and that always looks great when that's sort of a bit, a bit backlit as well. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. That's all right.
Yeah, I was going to ask a question about camera movement because in this film we have a lot of action scenes where the characters are riding on bikes or they're running towards the river, just like a lot of movement. I was wondering mm. what would be the best way to capture that in kind of an intimate way, like a, a connective way, because when I watch films, sometimes it feels very disconnected, like we can tell you're on a dolly. But I was just wondering how we could immerse ourselves in a moving scene. Yeah, well, I suppose there's lots of different ways of doing it, but I think what's often important is to have the camera feeling somewhat stabilised. If it's too rough, then you kind of feel it, it doesn't, you know, you can feel a bit disconnected then. And I think often, I think I think what you're talking about is often if it's the camera is um, not with the character and you're more observing, you don't feel like you're on that action journey with them. I mean, there's various things like body mounts, which can be done, which can be done as simply as a, as a selfie stick being held by the actor just out of shot to, you know, whether it's a camera mounted on the, on the bike itself. I think you often don't really want it to feel like the, your standard GoPro shot though. I think you want to try and get it in a position where it's, it looks a little bit more interesting. And I mean, there's different stabilizers. I don't know if you've looked into whether you can afford to get like the DJI have a, a DJI, sorry, have a little one that it's, that's like a stick, but that, it's like a it's like a movie i can't even remember what it's called but it's got it um you can put a, a dslr and smaller cameras on it too and they're, they're great for just really stabilizing the shot and you can you can attach that to the front of a bike or have someone else on a bike to to, to more elaborate ones as well i mean i don't know what equipment you've got access to but i do i've got a friend who does a lot of drone uh shots and his drone has a stabilizer in it and he'll often use it where he's not even flying the drone, but he'll attach it to objects just to use it for the stabilization. Um, like there's the the uh, DJ, uh, DJI um, Inspire 2, um, which is a fantastic drone with a really good quality camera on it. But he's he's done some brilliant shots where he's just used a magic arm and and mounted it onto his bike and got shots of his of his feet pedaling or the wheel or looking straight ahead to just looking at the road going. And it's just nice and smooth because the drone's taking all of that shock out of it and it's actually a fairly cheap way to to do it as well it's really interesting mm. thank you mm. i can imagine i can see that being really immersive so thank you um i think we're going to move on to the extracts that sasha sent you mm -hmm. um we might only have time for one um okay. if that's okay um, yeah okay Sabs has kindly shared screen. Um, so this is our opening shot. Um, and I think probably like the first wide shot that we have, um, and maybe the only one actually. Um, and I think my first question is kind of, kind of establishing like, the two figures like walking onto screen without it seeming like, oh, this is the start of a film and these actors are walking on as if on a stage. And, you know, um, I don't know. I think it's it's difficult because it's, it's kind of the way it's set up is maybe not as intimate as the other scenes in the um, film. So I don't know if you can maybe like talk about how you'd maybe set up the shot um, as a wide mm. shot with some of that atmosphere sure have you got a location already chosen for yeah so we're, we're shooting it in cambridge which mm -hmm. is so there's lots of like riverbanks mm. there. um so it's a pretty natural um location and have you have you guys talked have you and chloe talked about how you see the the blocking of that scene or uh, i mean because for, for me like there's a few different ways i guess you could do that as one shot and whether the actors are coming towards camera or whether it's wide enough to see them coming together in a and they're smaller in frame or what what have you guys talked about so far um personally i'd imagined that as they kind of like walk onto scene and you it's like shot with them farther far away and you they they in this scene very much just figures and we hear their voices and it's kind of not until the next scene that we uh see their faces but mm -hmm. that is just very unexperienced person <laughs> um talking about what was in my head at first so maybe that's a faux pas mm. no uh, chloe did you have 
when you when you read it did you have some thoughts it was really similar to what maddie said it was kind of wanted to make it feel continuous like we didn't want to cut in and make we didn't want cuts we wanted mm -hmm. to fill up where we're observing them but we don't want to introduce them too quickly and i think that's the feel we wanted it was just to be very observational and kind of like spark curiosity in our viewer with the mm -hmm. first shot so it's kind of a powerful shot so mm. that's how we want to approach it yeah cool i mean that sounds i think that sounds really that sounds brilliant but i think it is very location specific for that shot to work because if it's a very busy wide shot then you're not going to necessarily pick them out straight away and i imagine i mean do you see there's a few other people in this in the shot itself or is it just only these two are the only people within it i think only these two mm. yeah cool yeah because that's important otherwise you're not going to know which who's talking if there's a few other characters within there but um i mean i would think you'd need you'd want to find a, a, a location where you can find that frame where it's quite, you want it to be quite graphic, I'd imagine, and it's not so busy that you're not making them out or they get lost amongst the uh, foliage or greenery. And I, I would think you'd probably also want to try and choose a time of day when they could be backlit so they're more, um, you know, they're popping out from that, from the, um, the background a little bit too, because if they're just small figures that uh, you're not really making out that might start to get a little bit boring for the audiences, which is certainly not what you want to have happening there neither um yeah like i feel like we just if that's if that's what you've got in mind and i've worked like that too if a director's got a particular bit of blocking in mind then it's really finding that uh that location which lends itself to you being able to do that in a really interesting and and i, I feel for me i feel like it needs to be a really graphic frame because it, it's it, it's trying to say so much and do so much and, and you want it to also engage the audience enough to be looking at who these people are without being too distracted by stuff that isn't relevant to the to the scene mm -hmm. um yeah well actually that, that's another thing which is quite i think is quite important to consider amongst lots of your coverage that you you think about is that you never want to have something in the frame that the audience starts to question why is that there or what's that about or often audiences don't even necessarily register what's the what's in the background of it of an actor's shot but it, but it often will influence them as to how they interpret that uh, character or what it has to, maybe it could say something about them. You, you'll often choose an artwork or a object or something that's, that's has some relevance to who they are as a, as a character or to the, the history. And so I think with a shot like that, you don't want to have anything that misleads them or have them start to think, well, that is that an important thing to look at, whether it's a power line or a, or a shop or something that isn't really relevant to it, which is why I feel like it needs to be that graphic frame that you can take it in, see the architecture, but it's really about those, about those two characters coming together. I mean, there's a few, I can't, they're not all coming to mind, but I do, there's a few films I know of where they'll often do the desert shot where you can see characters walking across the desert and the one you hear their voices um, in the distance. And sometimes it's good to look at references um that do something similar not to so you're going to copy them but just so you can see what works with what they've done um i find a really great resource is um do you guys know shot deck have you heard of that it's a it's a um it was started up by a cinematographer lawrence Shear. he's an oscar nominated cinematographer he shot joker among other things but he started up this database where he's been he's collected frames just frame grabs from so many different movies and it's a database where you can search specifics like you could type in wide shot um two characters you can you could be quite specific and it'll just come up with lots of those kind of shots from other films mm -hmm. and and that's a great place to start for sharing your um starting your lookbook or to share ideas or say okay that works or that's the kind of shot that i thought of or you might find that once you start looking down there that you might find that there's a different idea or another way of doing it yeah, because yeah, that was the interesting thing when I was reading it, I was, I was wondering, yeah, is it a wide shot where you see the two come together or is it, uh, at one point I thought maybe it was, um, they were both walking towards camera, but they were quite, dis one of them was much more distant than the other one. So we're seeing both their faces and then the other one catches up to them and then they turn into profile in mm -hmm. the camera. And so then the shots, the shots developing and they're getting larger in frame. And then, they, then the two of them join each other, which I felt would work better than if they were, if you were to do a similar shot and they're coming in different directions, because you'd be looking at the back of one of them or one of them wouldn't be yeah. in the shot. I, I think in my head, it was kind of this like comical scene where you see them walk together, 
then one realizes the other then start work walking away and then you get the bottle thrown at their back and it's like almost a little bit slapstick and it's just like these two like little little stick figures almost in the distance and it's just it's just them on the scene yeah um, yeah and I think also I don't know if th this will end up changing because I'm then like wondering how we then get back to the relationship in the next scene and how we transition transition that um like back into like a the kind of intimate language of the of the film um mm. yeah well that's an interesting thing to to think about i think if if the next uh characters you see are these two characters then i would think and you're hearing the same voices i, I think it shouldn't be too much of a stretch for the audience to know well obviously this is this is them again mm -hmm. but i mean that's that, that is a conversation i'll often have with the director is at what point in the opening sequence do we have our first big this is our lead actor shot when does that happen um and i was just having that conversation with um claire about the film we're about to start now and we were saying we want to we want to save it we want to we're going to see her in wide shots and see her from behind, see her in a silhouette, and we've, she's, we're getting hints of her and her environment because we want to set up the world that she's in before we establish who she is. Yeah. And um, so we're really saving it, which I think if we're going to do that, we really want to make it feel worth it for the audience as well, because you don't want them to be switching off because they're like, I don't care who is this person. You want to make it feel like when you finally get to see their their face that, okay, now they're you've already got them gripped and, and yeah. um, locked into it. So that, I mean, that's something which would be an interesting conversation for, for mm -hmm. you and Chloe to have is like, how can you, do you want to, do you want to keep it wide and do similar playing out wider shots of staging until you get to a certain point, which might be a certain emotional point or a certain reveal or that you really, that's, that's your time to finally go to that close up. Yeah, that's actually really exciting to think about because I think that would work really well. Um, and yeah, thanks, that's actually great. <laughs> That's all right. When you asked about when you're reading a script and think, okay, that's a visual effects shot, and when is it not? Like, one thing that didn't occur to me first, but then just thinking it through then again, is that what you would really not want to have happen when you're shooting this opening shot is to get the perfect performance and the perfect take, but your actor doesn't hit her in the back with the bottle or it keeps yeah. missing or you're having trouble doing that. And that's often something which can quite easily be helped in, in visual effects. Mm. Um, and I don't know if it would work for you here, but something that a little trick that I've often done, um, I mean, it's not just me. I mean, David Fincher does it too. You can often, if you've got a locked off camera, you can use performances from two different moments within the same shot. Um, and he'll, David Fincher will use it in a, in a two shot where you've got two actors bouncing off each other. You can use one performance from one take and the, the other actor from another take to just, you can tighten it up because you've got too long a gap between performances so you can, tighten that up a little bit. Might be a bit tricky if you're outdoors and the wind's blowing or birds are flying through or you got water rippling, but you can, I mean, you could still build that, too. Could, like the water could have its own mm. little split screen and the two actors could have their own split screen if you just needed to slip the performance a little bit. Mm. And um, I mean, you you would never want it to look like an effect shot, but to get that bottle to hit, I mean, there, there could be something that um, that works there where I don't know. I mean, I think that's that could be that's often something where we've, I've done other shots where it's just as simple as we're doing a big wide shot and the boom swinger just really wants to get the boom in on the actors to get that quality of sound, but they just can't because the shot's too wide and there's too much headroom. And then we've said, well, we'll just lock off the camera, get the boom right in where you need it, and then we'll just do a, do a split screen to remove. It's not even a visual effect. It's just because you've recorded some clean uh, of the same shot. You just split screen that bit off and it removes the removes the boom straight away. I mean, there's lots of different little moments where you can do that. There was one where we needed to do a wide shot in a big hall and there was nowhere for me to put any backlight on the on the actors because it was just it was all going to be in shot and you could see the ceiling, but we really wanted to see them pop out. So we mounted a light in the shot and then we took it out and shot didn't move the camera, it was locked off. And then we just did a split screen. So it had the ceiling without the light in it, but then there was this sort of magic backlight that was coming from nowhere, lighting lighting our actors, and that looked really nice too. 
bit of movie magic. I think that's mm. all we have time for, actually. Thank you so much for giving us your time. It's so been so interesting hearing sort of like about how Jordan Peele always thinks about his audiences, just sort of like your tips and tricks that we can take into, into swim. So thank you so, so much. Absolute pleasure. Thank you.